Um, we talk about a lot of different things. I'm not going to you know, get ahead of my skis here and talk too much about what we discussed in the show. Uh, one thing I didn't mention in the show that I did want to mention a little bit is the idea of persona in the Jungian uh, thought. And the persona is basically the social mask that we wear, the social roles that we play. And there's a problem inherently in mistaking that mask for your true self. And there's a whole bunch of neuroses that sort of falls out of an over-identification with your persona, with your mask, with your social role. And I thought it was interesting to tie that into the workplace because I've experienced this and I'm sure um, many of you have experienced. In, in Marxist terms, we, we, would, we would call it alienation or right? alienation from oneself. But this putting on of a fake personality while you're at work, particularly those engaged in customer service, you have this fake tone, this fake cadence, this fake way of speaking. You wear clothes you otherwise wouldn't have worn. You you supervise yourself in your own head around your boss, around your coworkers, around customers in ways that when you're free of those bounds, you don't do. Um, and it becomes, especially for sensitive people, very restrictive. The alienation ratchets up. And I know when I worked in retail, for example, um, I had to suppress my authentic self for eight hours a day. And it took a fucking toll on my mental health. Um, now, this is just one example. The, the idea of persona can extend much beyond this, this one example. But it is something where I think a union analysis dovetails nicely with the Marxist conception of alienation and helps make more a sense of, of both concepts in the meantime. Um, and, you know, I would leave work. I would be in bad moods that I couldn't explain. I would have bouts of, of depression, deep sense of meaninglessness, etc. And there was, in, in retrospect, I can make sense of this split self and how there is a suppression of my authentic self in favor and in service to um, the, the business I worked at and ultimately their bottom line, their profit margins. And that was a radically alienating experience. And I'm, I'm not the only one that has, has experienced that. So that's just one example of the ways in which Jungian thought and psychoanalysis more broadly can be brought in, married to a more robust Marxist or political philosophical analysis, and both things come out the better for it. So with all of that in mind, let's get into this episode. And if you're interested in this conversation, I'm going to do more work on my Patreon on this topic, talking a little bit about the connections with Jung and um, the rise of Nazism and some of the critiques aimed at him in that direction. I talk more about the contributions Jung has made to, to psychology and just to the popular culture, etc. So if you're at all interested, join us um, on Patreon, which we'll link in the show notes, and get more of, of this sort of discussion, things that I, I couldn't cover in this episode. So without further ado, here's this wonderful conversation with Spencer. Um, after you listen to this, go subscribe to Thoughts on Thinking, show him Rev Left Love in the comment section, and, and let him know that, that our listenership appreciates him coming on and helping us learn about uh, Carl Jung. Here's the episode. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Spencer. It's, it's a real honor. Um, let's just dive into the, the, the questions here. And let's just start off with a general overview. What is the value of studying Carl Jung and his work, in your opinion? So, yeah, the fundamental value that anyone can take away from Jung's work is a better understanding of one's own psyche from an outside perspective. Something that brings him above many philosophers, I think, uh, and intellectuals is that his ideas are not just theoretical but were developed out from the subjective empirical work he did with his clients for many many years and it has been an absolute joy studying his work and applying it into my own thought for my own personal studies and work and seeing how much personal developmental benefit people get from the ideas he developed and then you know putting them from my own videos and work or on the likes of the internet and YouTube. Uh, today, among myself and a fair few other channels, there has kind of been what you could call a modern Jungian resurgence uh, within the modern uh, modern generation, where people, obviously as a niche, but where the people applying this work to many different fields and disciplines for the sake of modern societal psychological analysis, which shows another value that is that is work brings by the mere fact. Uh, that is very broad and applicable to many aspects of life because it is fundamentally the study of the psyche. 
In today's world, with things like the introduction of the digital and all the forms of it, there is an increasing amount of new reformed material that can be analysed through the psychological lens to truly understand the purpose of many peculiar existences, for example memes, and a guy called Chris Gabriel is doing, who runs meme analysis, is doing a fantastic job at that at the moment. Uh, so what Jung also tried to do was make comparative study between religion and the psyche, which is one of the many reasons why his work has become so influential in many different fields, whether it be influencing the work of historians, anthropologists, uh, writers, to quantum physicists, because he identified uh, an archetypal psychological link between the two throughout the cultures, and is one reason why he has become increasingly popular within the mainstream, and not just said within the psychoanalytic realm. Yeah, I absolutely uh, agree with that with that analysis, and I think that is, you know, so much of the central thrust of not only why he's valuable for for people that are interested in self knowledge and for intellectuals, but why there is a sort of cultural resurgence at this time uh, surrounding Jungian thought, um, and and that the aspect about religion is interesting as well. You know, you th we often think of Jung and Freud as deeply connected. Some, I think, even somewhat mistakenly, will think of Jung as a disciple of Freud, and in some ways that's true, but Jung had his own sort of career and interest in psychology before meeting Freud, and while Freud was an influence, I don't think it's proper to say that it was a, a direct descendant line, but Freud did have this uh, sort of knee-jerk dismissal of religion and religious experiences, which is what I'm more interested in formal organizational religion. I'm more interested in the religious experience or what we would call the mystical experience. And Jung does not do away with that. Jung brings that on board and does much more justice to the religious impulse um, in the human psyche than I think Freud was capable of. And that's one of the reasons why I, I enjoy Jung um, is because of, of that element that is a big part of my life. And then just the general, the general truth of using psychoanalysis and using Jungian thought to help clarify in your own self, to gain deeper levels of self-knowledge, to work through neuroses, and to come to a more profound and more integrated conception and experience of yourself. I think can only be beneficial. But speaking of Freud, it leads perfectly into this next question, which is, in what ways does Jung overlap with and differ from Freud? Well, one of the most profound differences they had was surrounding religion. Freud saw religion as something of neurotic form, that it was an extension of the desire for an ultimate father figure, basically. And because of this, he believed that its true functioning was that of a infantile unconscious illusion, similar to a form of wish fulfillment, you could say. And he made links saying, well look, why is God referred to as the Almighty Father in Christianity? Thus it must be of a similar dynamic to the Oedipus complex, but in a reverse fashion. Instead, it is towards an Almighty fi uh, Father figure that can lead the way of civilization or keep people in line with a morality, uh, an extension of this of the super ego but jung didn't like this he didn't he didn't see religion as an extension of the super ego uh, for an infantile necessity but as an internal universal expression of archetypes from and within the collective unconscious jung for example saw the idea of atman meaning soul within hinduism as an archetype for the self any kind of religious spiritual structure that forwarded, uh, forwarded itself towards enlightenment or self-realization would constitute this idea of archetypal form and you also have it in Hinduism as well with meditation or to overcome maya or illusion one has to reject the object for the subject for example to realize the self uh, indiv uh, individuation or realization of the self through an undifferentiation uh, of, of consciousness as the absolute reality. So this is a, a very monist idea, but also very concentrated around this idea of, around the self. And again, you have it in Gnosticism, achieving gnosis or knowledge, knowledge through experience to attain the regenerative, uh, how do you say, it? regenerative wisdom 
of Sophia that is beyond the god of imprisoning matter, which was referred to as the Demiurge in Gnosticism. So with this small kind of comparative look at different religions, Jung identified uh, that no, there is an archetypal behaviour within these religions that are intended for a purpose that is far beyond what Freud saw within them. And this is one way the collective unconscious within Jungian psychology came about, through these comparative archetypal observations.